Comic-Con was so diverse. And it was not just diverse uh, in terms of skin color, it was diverse in terms of age, it was clearly diverse in terms of, uh, kind of socioeconomic background. And from that, I really I kind of took away from that a couple of things. One was I'd been talking a lot about this subject with, with people in the game, but also like by trade, I'm an investment banker. And one of the things I do at work is I head our kind of inclusion part for our investment bank. Uh, so I, have, I kind of do it in multiple spheres. Um, and I, it really caused me to think about, well, how is it that Comic-Con gets such a diverse audience and yet LARP, which I've experienced to be really open and welcoming on the whole, has, is not like that. So this talk is a little bit around uh, my experience of LARP, what I think some of the obstacles are, and what I think perhaps we need to change if we really want to design games that are more open. Um, so, and I'm going to go through, I've got references for, for, for like of, me, of media where I think people are doing stuff well. Um, and I think, like, with my kids I watch a lot of uh, anime, I watch a lot of uh, fantasy and nerdy stuff. Uh, and I was kind of thinking about stuff where I've seen a lot of diversity done well. And everything has its problems, so I'm going to overlook those in this particular case. But I think things like uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, not the James Cameron uh, nonsense. Um, I think things like uh, Yasuke, the trifecta of anime, so One Piece, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, Attack on Titan. Um, but I also think of things like the D&D movie, which, which I think did diversity kind of really well from a white person's perspective, and I'll explain more about what I mean by that later. Um, but I also think things like the, the new Rings of Power show, whether you like it or not, uh, and quite a lot of people don't like it because of the diversity, how dare we have black elves in a fantasy world. Um, I think it does that really well. It kind of captures that idea of actually some of these things we can do differently, we can do better, and actually we can make them more open to kind of people who aren't like us. So for the rest of the talk, uh, the format is, I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk about race only. Right. For me, there's a really important thing here about inclusivity, which is that it's intersectional. And what I mean by that is, if you are working class or female presenting or someone who might uh, uh, have problems interacting with people kind of easily and you become anxious, those are all important things that we need to think about for accessibility and about designing our games. They, I would say if we want to create inclusive games, they're as important as thinking about race. I can't speak to all of those. So I'm going to focus on race, because that's important to me. So that's where I'm going to talk about. But I think a lot of the things I'm talking about here map to those other questions. But I'm just not going to talk about them, because otherwise I'd be here for a whole weekend. And you don't want to hear me talk that long. Trust me. Um, so it's probably worth saying, why am I talking about this? So my name is Stuart Hodgson. Uh, I grew up in uh, my, my background is uh, I used to say mongrel, I don't say that anymore, but there's a reason. So my father is uh, Ukrainian Egyptian, and my mother is Franco-Irish Indian English. So as a friend of mine says, there's nowhere in the world I can't go where someone won't hate me. Um, for a lot of my life, we thought my father was Jewish, uh, because his grandmother told him he was, his mother told him she was Jewish. The reason she told him he was Jewish, and we only found out that she wasn't, and nor was he when she died, was because uh, her family were killed, all of them except her, uh, in uh, Dachau. And she walked at the end of the war after the Americans liberated Dachau to Calais and came over here. And such was the racism against Roma people, which is what she was, she was Ukrainian Roma, that she said she was Jewish instead. So you could imagine how bad it was if that was the story she felt was more acceptable to tell at the end of the Second World War. Um, I only found this out when she died and they went through her papers and discovered lots of uh, communications that were in Ukrainian and explained to us why she never taught my father Polish because she said she was a Polish Jew. But she wasn't. Um, so anyway, I, I am really mixed. I have multiple heritages. I identify with almost none of them because I wasn't brought up, I wasn't brought up Indian. Uh, my mother uh, fled here as part of partition uh, and the, the genocide that happened there. Um, obviously, there's clearly no family history at all beyond my father's, on my father's side. So I have nothing culturally to identify with. So I, I, and, and when I was growing up, my mother was like, they set up a thing at school for uh, people of color. Um, my mother refused to let me attend. 
uh, because she came from that first immigration mentality which was you assimilate, you don't be different because being different is what got us into this trouble in the first place. I've been role playing since about 2001 with some breaks here and there and I kind of with a group of friends, we took over Curious Pastimes uh, in 2020, 2020, 2021? 21, thank you, Will. Um, so I, but I've been kind of staffing and crewing and helping write games for about the last eight years. So all those various bits and pieces combined have kind of brought me to this place where I want to write and talk about this subject. It's partly my own self-exploration, to be really blunt, as I kind of figure out how to talk about these things myself because for a good 30 years of my life, it wasn't really a subject I knew how to talk about. Certainly for the first 20 years of my life, it wasn't a subject I was encouraged to talk about at all. So, my experience of LARP. On the whole, I've experienced no overt racism or very little overt racism at the LARPs I've attended, for which I am extremely grateful because I wouldn't be doing it at this point if earlier on, before I kind of got into running things, I'd encountered kind of racists. Um, we could talk about other kind of types of racism, but I'm really pleased to say that I've never kind of experienced something where I've kind of gone, wow, you're a racist twat. Um, and, and I felt like I needed to take action. Um, that's about as rude as I'm going to get because I'm being filmed. Did, I did toy with the idea of kind of speaking a bit more frankly, but um, anyway. So when I think about, okay, so I think the question I then have is, I've experienced LARP not to be any worse and probably a little bit better than average society. Uh, you know, I have, in, in, within the last year, sat on a train on the way home from work and sat next to a man who openly texted, uh, oh, I'm sat next to a packy, he smells of curry, whilst I was sat next to him on the train. So I have not experienced that at LARP, right? So given that LARP is at least as good as or better than normal society, I couldn't understand why I didn't see more people like me at events that I really love attending. And so I started to try and think about, right, okay, what's the real problem here? And actually, to be honest, it's taken me a long time to kind of get to a point where I can articulate what I think is a set of reasonable reasons. Because I've talked about it with a lot of people and I've had some really bad reasons given to me. I've had reasons like, oh, well, uh, in, uh, Indians or, or, or Muslims, one person said, they don't tell stories. And I was like, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I've, had, uh, I've had, it's not part of their culture. Again, thank you. Um, I've had a basic underlying suspicion, particularly from my middle class white friends, that, well, this is the thing that we do, and I'm not sure, it, you know, it's not really for them, is it? It's kind of a suspicion that it's not for people who aren't like them. Um, that speaks again to class, I think, but we won't talk about that too much. But that's definitely something for us to reflect upon, I think, about how we make our games more inclusive for people who aren't highly educated. Right? There are lots of people who would like to crew and write who probably stumble because they're not super well educated and find that quite a block. And they're a bit scared that people will think them as rubbish because they're trying to do something that, oh, well, they've got a degree or that, you know, they've got this or they're super smart or they're super professional. That's something for us to reflect upon about how we draw people in who have got loads to give but we don't necessarily see them. And I do see that as a real thing. I, I don't know how about other people feel about it, but. So when I'm thinking about why don't people play, I think about all the things that have changed, particularly in the last five or six years, right? Most LARPs I know have some sort of inclusivity statement. They have some sort of statement about behaviors that they don't think is acceptable. They've got a bit better on, on average, I think about dealing with incidents. Uh, where things have to be dealt with, whether those are unfortunately sexual assault in nature, all the way through to overt racism and homophobia and other bits and pieces. Most LARPs have got better at dealing with that sort of stuff. Um, they're also more friendly, I think, than people might expect to uh, queer culture, which I'm super pleased about. And it's something that at Curious Pastimes, we're really, really aggressive about being kind of open and kind of non-tolerant to behavior that would be exclusionary around those sorts of uh, cultures and communities. So again, why are people of color not coming to more of our games? And to give you a bit of the statistics, we had 1,300 players at Renewal last year. There are 14% of the population are people like me in some form or another. That means we should have had oh, 220 people of colour at Renewal. We did not have 220 people of colour at Renewal. We did not have 110 people like that. We had maybe 22, so 
So statistically, just at random, if I picked people at random off the street, we should have had 220. For us to have fewer than that, particularly 90% of, uh, like, to only 10% of the numbers we should expect by random selection, there is some gatekeeping going on, which means that those communities and people like me who aren't even necessarily part of those communities are feeling that it's not something for them. That means we are doing something to stop them coming in. So, I think there are a bunch of obstacles, and I'm going to talk about those now, and then I'm going to talk about after that some things that I think we can do better, and perhaps some solutions for us to start thinking about. And then at the end, we're going to kind of break down into groups of five or six, and I'm going to give you some things to ask each other about what you might do to, to kind of if you were designing games, and then we'll feed back. Sorry, it's going to turn into a seminar at the end. <laughs> um, there, are no, there, are, there are bad ideas, but they only have to be bad once, and then you can get rid of them. So my first obstacle is Eurocentrism. And what I mean by that is most games rely on European myth. In the paper I wrote, I was ruder. I said most games rely on a bastardized Victoriana. This is why we have dragons the way we have dragons. It's why we have orcs the way we have orcs. It's why we have trolls the way we have trolls. Uh, you know, it's why, so for me, and before I get to that, we have European political systems. We have, uh, I'm going to have to edit that because it's rude. We're going to have to ha we have kings and we have aristocrats. We have white views of the world. We have cowboys where there's no indigenous people. We have, um, we have empires that are expansionary without criticizing the fact that empires are a really bad thing. Uh, both of my grandparents, or three of the four of my grandparents fled to this country because of imperial ambition by white people. Right? For me, that is it's not something I want to see people role-playing. Because, do you know what? I have really live members of my family who were persecuted because of British Empire and others because of the German, Austro-Hungarian legacy and, and Nazism. There's no interest to me in role-playing in that sort of game. Because why the hell would I want to kind of take part in something that, within living memory, has been a, an object of my oppression? I could understand it if you were running a game about empire that is critical and picks apart what empire does. Dune 2 is a great example of that as a movie. But games that are openly expansionary about empire, I'm sorry, but for, for as a person of colour, that is an immediate red flag. Uh, and you know what? It really amazes me that for liberal Democrats, we are so keen to role play being kings. What the hell? Like. We killed a bunch of royal people and aristocrats to stop the idea of you having magic blood, and yet somehow we want to play in games like that. For me, again, it's like, okay, fine, but at what point are we going to critique these things so that other people know we're not doing it ironically? Myths come back to this idea of Victoriana. Nearly, mo well, nearly all of the European myths I come across are, are through the lens of what the Victorians decided they should feel like. Um, the, the other part of it, obviously, I think is, um, is capitalism, and we'll come to that in a moment, about how that privatises a lot of what we believe, uh, and it changes what we think is acceptable, certainly separates us from most of the rest of the world and how they think about how the world works. But back to myths. I'm like, look, I'm really not interested in the myths of the Wild West, because they're nearly all white. They don't, ex they don't, they don't even talk about the people who were there before them. They don't talk about the slaves that the West was built upon. The reason, there's a myth that cowboy comes from the Dutch, and it doesn't. It comes from the fact that a boy is a black male slave, and the cowboy was a black male slave that looked after your cows, the herd. That is a problem. The fact that white people have co-opted it and told themselves a lie to explain why they call themselves that is a problem that we need to interrogate. Our games can do that, or we just don't play in that space. I think both are valid, but to do it uncritically is a problem for me. And, it, and when I say it's a problem for me, what I mean is, is if you want more people of different types coming to your game, you, can, you need to address these issues. You can't just kind of go, well, I like playing in Victorian kit, so I'm going to play a game where there's no racism. Except that Victorian society is founded upon slave trade. Bristol looks the way it does because of the millions of pounds that were earned from the slave trade. So. You can't, we well, can just say, I'm going to dress up as a Victorian and enjoy myself and not think about those things. Great, I won't be joining you, and nor will anybody who looks like me. 
uh, I've put, look, saying there's no racism is, is an approach, it's, but it's not rescuing the past like you think it is. It's erasing the past for the sake of kind of fun now. Races. This is really thorny and I don't have a clear answer to this, but I hate range, racial essentialism. D&D is built upon racial essentialism, whereas this race is good at this, that race is good at that. Oh, humans, who are by default white, oh, they can do anything. But all the other races who have different coloured skins, they all, all can only do one thing well. That there is eugenics, it is racial essentialism, it's really bad. So one thing we've done as part of our rules review, is we've got rid of race. It's gone. There will be no, not only will there be no mechanical use for being an elf or versus a dwarf, we have said we don't really want people to even call themselves those things. We want you to identify with the culture that your group is from. We don't really want you saying I'm an elf because actually all those different peoples and all those different cultures have their cultural history that we'd rather that they role played to. That's a solution. I, it's not the perfect solution, but it's the one that we think probably fits with us right now partly because it's too thorny to, I think, to kind of come to something that works more generally, particularly because it's fantasy. There's also deeply problematic symbols that we use all over the place without thinking about it. Um, whether it's Gollum, which we don't use now because it's, it's kind of tied up with anti-Semitism anti really badly. Uh, whether it's Judeo-Christian stuff like succubi and, and other names, specific names for specific types of monster in the night. We, we have tried to get rid of, we're trying to get rid of, we're trying to get rid of them. We're doing it bit by bit rather than everything all at once. But they're all quite European, right? The word yokai in Japanese is nearly always translated as demon in English. That's not what it means. And monster actually just means omen, warning, sign in the Greek where it comes from. So we, we mistranslate a lot of stuff because we don't have the concepts in, in English to kind of and it's not even the concept in the language, it's the emotional landscape, it's the creative landscape we don't have the concepts for. I'm really keen that we find, and that people who write games, find new names for the things that they're putting in. Even if, under the surface, there's something that's really recognisable. Why? Well, because it changes the way we think about this stuff, and it takes out some of the immediate assumptions about the way things should work. And the problem with a lot of our games is, we default to what is normal for us. And what is normal for most of us is just normal white society. Um, so I struggle with, I also struggle, so I also struggle with games where we have stuff like uh, Vikings or, or Crusaders. But I, the, the next time, I, I shudder every time I see someone in, in white kit with a red cross on it. Because that is not a good look. But I also struggle with the Norse stuff because Norse stuff is catnip for Odinism and uh, American white racists who love to kind of tell themselves a myth about what the Vikings were. We can kind of rescue some of that stuff by being really clear about what we're doing. And we can rescue some of that stuff by, you know, it's a fantasy game, so we can build the fantasy elements in and deconstruct and question those, those myths. And we can also be really clear about the fact that we aren't interested in having racists at our games and really explicitly saying that. And games that aren't prepared to say that and run those sorts of cultures, I think are problematic because they're basically saying, not only am I not going to say no to racism, but I'm, I am going to run a game which is almost certainly likely to attract people who are attracted to those symbols for their use within a racist context. You can't, you can't not say anything about it if you're going to use that symbolism. I also don't want, gay, I don't want organizers to say to me, oh, well, there were, like, there, were, there were brown people in Norway at the time. I'm like, yes, there was one. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll be that guy, shall I? I'll be the Arab who came from, uh, what's Egypt now? And that's what I'll role play. Thanks. That's great. The rest of you can do what you like, but I'll be that guy. That's not a game for me. I've played, I've played in those games. There's a, there was a game set in Anglo-Saxon England which was, which was really good fun to crew, but it was all white. And it couldn't really be anything else because it was set in a historical period uh, uh, around the fall of the Kingdom of Wessex. So it was set specifically in things that actually happened. So it was always going to exclude people like me. You could say, well, it doesn't matter if you're brown. I'm like, it does matter. Because you've built a game 
that's not going to include people like me unless I pretend I'm white. And that's basically what you're saying. You're saying, you can come, we won't look at your skin colour. And I'm like, thank you, but I do look at my skin colour. It's important to me. So, that's the, uh, that's the world building, the Eurocentrism. The next one is the hero's journey. If I never have to read another hero's journey again, it will be too soon. For those of you who don't know what the hero's journey is, there is some nonsense around that says, um, there's only seven types of story. That's absolute rubbish. It's only Westerners who think that. Because other people have different types of story. For, for a lot of people in the world, survival is victory. Not beating the enemy. It's surviving the enemy is victory. That is their catharsis. That they were, Someone tried to kill them and they survived. They didn't get revenge. They didn't come out on top. They didn't become the most powerful. They didn't level up. They just survived. Because do you know what? That's a lot of their lived experience too. And actually, a lot of their lived experience is not surviving. And that's why we hate empires. Um, there are other types of story. There's tragedy. There's losing, there's losing well. There's losing badly. There's stories where it's just like, the, a really big thing right now is, is an animal crossing. Right? That's, what the hell is that about? There's, the story there is about just day to day, living, doing things well in community. Those are great stories. We should tell more stories about doing well in community, about how we help each other. Those are great stories. You can have conflict too, but there's all sorts of types of stories we could tell. I'm really tired of LARPs, which are just the white story of farm boy orphan, does it all alone, beats someone, and is always the hero, and can never be beaten, because being beaten is an outrage. The only people who tell that story are the people who've been winning all the time. So there are other stories to tell. Then I think our views about religion and faith. LARP is a, all, all stories about faith are difficult if told from outside that lived experience, right? So I'm, I'm picking on LARP because that's what we're talking about. LARP is really dumb about faith. It, mainly because it's written by people who don't practice a faith or they practice a privatised faith, a faith that's sanctioned by capitalism, like modern paganism. And I don't mean to criticise modern paganism in any way, but it's a mo it, as a form of faith, it's a privatised faith, in that it fits quite well with capitalism and libertarianism. It's fully individualised. It doesn't require communal praxis as, as an integral part of it. And by praxis, I mean specifically right practice. That's, that's what the word means. It's the type of thing where, as a community, you do something to affect some sort of outcome. Um, but kind of getting away from that, it means that because we don't have much lived, and I include myself largely in this, we don't have much lived experience of faith. And so we find it really, really difficult to tell stories that treat faith as meaningful. But for most of the world and for nearly all of human history, life should be seen through that lens. Um, people find it really hard to accept that someone like Isaac Newton had a faith. Now, he was a mad Aryan, um, in, not in the Nazi sense of Aryan, but in the, in the Christian sense of Aryan. But at the same time, that was really important to him. And a lot of the science he did was through that lens. That was why he was also an alchemist. Um, and yet it didn't stop him being rational. It didn't stop him being, well, he was a bit of a nutter, but it didn't stop him being the person he was. It informed who he was. And everything he did and everything he saw was through that lens. He didn't have a privatised faith. He didn't say at any point, well, I, I go to church on a Sunday or I go to solstice and that's when I express my faith. Everything he does from the, getting up in the morning and going to bed at night is, is through that faith. So we aren't really good at telling those stories. And I think it's because we don't have the lived experience of it. And that's something that I, again, think is problematic because it's quite alienating when you have a faith of some sort and most of the world does, and they see games which struggle to articulate what, whether that's meaningful or not. And actually, I think we do try to find our way towards it a lot of the time, but we're struggling, we, we struggle towards it rather than trying to think about how do we write about this in a way that gives people a chance to explore it. Now, you might say for a lot of people, it, they, it doesn't matter because they're not trying to explore what faith means. But actually, if, we are, if we've got gods and priests and stuff in the game, 
and then we need to be a bit more serious about how we regard these things because we're trying to write something that other people are going to be coming into and it might not be important to us but it is going to be of interest to them and it will be something that other people who do come to the world with that kind of view think oh this is a place where it's a safe place like LARP is completely safe right to explore stupid ideas and press the red button there's no reason why we can't do that for, for those sorts of ways of thinking we just we just probably need to find some people who are actively faithful and kind of talk to them about it so there are outright problems like those are all structural problems about how we design games there are obviously outright problems that we also have to deal with right and we again i think we've moved a long way we we don't have black elves anymore um, with what, which is you know white people with black makeup on i did want to run a group but i wasn't allowed or i couldn't get the people to do it where i wanted to be uh, black elves who had white face um, but uh, yeah, no, no white people would black up and then white over the top. So <laughs> I couldn't run the group on my own. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, yeah, you know what? <laughs> but I think slavery is a really difficult thing for us to be doing, right? I think, I think there's almost no way to do that right because it's, it's, it's too heavy with legacy, right? The other problem is, is that there are different types of slavery through history, right? I, would, I, I wouldn't want to be a slave at all, but if you had to choose, you'd rather be a Roman slave than, a, than an American slave because 10% of Roman slaves are manu, manumitted every year on average. None on average were manumitted in, uh, in the Deep South, right? So you, you take your pick, right? And they could become full citizens of Rome. They could become freed people. So there's, there's really di so there's lots of different types of slavery, but we can't do it well, I don't think. And I would rather that is one thing I would rather we avoid because there are lots of people who kind of look at that and kind of go, eh, eh, it's tricky. Like the British Empire ran uh, indentured Indians through to the 1920s. Late 1929, I think, was the last time an Indian was indentured and sent overseas to work as a slave. They weren't called slaves because slave Britain had outlawed slavery. But from the point of outlawing slavery through to 1929, Indians were uh, kind of put into debt and then sent overseas. And the Americans learned from that really well because when they had emancipation, guess what they did? They carved out in the uh, amendment that people who had committed crime could still be slaves. Oh, guess what? We're going to criminalize the black, black class, black black people so they can still be slaves and that's exactly what happens and continues to happen now you can read about it in lots of academic papers it's a it's an industry in the US so I think for a lot of people it's just too difficult and I, it's the type of thing where it's like it's not even fun to explore but I just think it has to be off the table <coughs> I've talked about Empire the last thing I want to talk about in terms of real problems is apocalyptic games there's a fantastic book called um, uh, After the End by Claire McIntosh, <coughs> where she writes about uh, the point that lots of people have actually experienced an apocalypse, just not many white people. So white people have a Judeo-Christian apocalypse that they think about. Most of the rest of the world doesn't have that, but what they do have is experiences of empire, which has taught them really hard what apocalypse means. You can look at the difference between how King, uh, Godzilla is portrayed in Japan and, and in the West, in Japan, he is a harbinger of, of destruction who can't be controlled. In the latest Western adaptations, he's a protector of humanity. That tells you everything you need to know about the kind of emotional capability of understanding whether the world can end or whether it can end. If you're turning like what is originally a, a symbol of uh, a, like apocalyptic destruction that's uncontrollable into a pet, it's because you can't imagine that thing not being under your control. I would say the Japanese have a really good understanding of that not being under their control. Um, and I think that, that type of stuff is important for us to think about because you could think, actually post-apocalyptic games can get right away from all of this. And I'm actually I'm like, they can, but actually at the same time, they're tapping into a lot of suffering that it's just, it's just modern Western society hasn't experienced it. Everybody else has, and they can remember it. And actually, my grandfather in the Second World War, we talked about a lot particularly his sinking on, a, on an aircraft carrier, he could understand it too. So I think it's just us now in the last 50 years who kind of look at it and kind of go, 
I just can't imagine bad things happening. So what shall I do? I'll play a game where bad things happen to me. And I, I would distinguish that from tragedy, because tragedy is a form of drama, from post-apocalyptic. Because for post-apocalyptic, a lot of our tropes are the other that's undifferentiated, who threatens our way of life. Well, guess what? That's what white flight is. That's what drives white flight, people. Um, white flight, for those who don't know, is where brown people move into your neighborhood, so all the white people move out. Um, it's that sort of stuff. So apocalyptic games, I think, are interesting, but they, they don't escape from this discussion either because they, what they're built from are ideas about being uh, at the top of the pile and not being at the top of the pile anymore. So they're built from a really specific social construct. So I've been talking about problems. But I think, for me, the real discussion is where do we go? How can we, how can we do something more interesting? How can we get those people at Comic-Con to go, really like that, I'm going to come and play? I think there's kind of three, three ways of doing this. One is to take inspiration from existing cultures. And there's loads of books, and there's loads of TV, and there's loads of movies that do that. And there's loads of games. Um, you know, and, uh, like good examples of this are Tasha, uh, these are all, nearly all authors. Um, but I would say, look, if you want to see good examples of this, read Tasha Suri, read Eliza Chan, Naila Hopkinson, uh, Evan Winters, Anna Stevens, Marlon James. There's a, I can give you a whole long list of people who are writing really interesting stories where they are, a lot of them are people from those contexts who are reinterpreting where they're coming from and telling really super interesting stories about, about their backgrounds. Uh, in both science fiction and fantasy settings. It's harder on the TV side, but I think, and they're nearly all animation actually, um, Star Wars Visions I think did a really great job of this. Uh, There's a bunch of shorts, uh, Star Wars, the, the Lucasfilm basically went to a bunch of Japanese anime studios and just said, just make us some shorts, do whatever the hell you like. And the stuff that came back was really amazing. Uh, there's, a, there's an Indonesian show called Trese, which is really good. Uh, there's, uh, there's Kazizi Moto, which is another animation on Disney, but that's uh, from a bunch, it's almost the same as Star Wars Visions, but they gave a load of money to uh, nine different African animation studios and said, make us a bunch of shorts. And they did, and they're all fantastic. And they're all in different styles, and they're all from different parts of Africa. They're really interesting takes on, mod that, like they've modernized a lot of their myths uh, for their own, you know, to tell their own stories. But again, really good ways of taking inspiration from your culture to tell something new. But the danger there is, is if, if uh, would I want to tell a China, retell a Chinese myth? Well, even though I've got quite a lot of different heritages, that's not one of them, and I don't really understand chi Chinese culture particularly. I'd be wary of designing a game as a white person or as me, where it was all about um, the Three Kingdoms, right? Or I'd be wary about telling a story about uh, feudal Japan, because it's too easy to be appropriative and fall into cliches and Orientalism which is a, a way of looking at the rest of the world through our eyes and kind of saying, oh, all samurai were like this. And that's clearly nonsense, right? They're all just like us, all the, they're all their own people. So it's one way of doing it, it's taking inspiration, but it's, I think it's probably the most difficult of the three areas that I'm going to suggest. The second one is, why don't we just make up completely new stories? That one, I really like this one. I, I'm, I think, it's, I think this is the most interesting. I think it's probably the most difficult because um, new, completely new stories, no, it's, really, it's not necessarily easy to find a way in. If someone says, I've got the blarty blah of thingy me bob and, you're, you know, and we're going to go over there and you're going to speak to the Ujigi, uh, and people are going to go, I don't understand any of what you've just said. It's all brand new. It's got, it's kind of, in theory, it's got no structural problems, but also nobody has any idea what you're doing. They have, they've got no way of kind of getting a hook to find a way to play. So I think it's a, that's the most exciting thing to do. I think lots of new TV, like uh, I think of shows like um, Severance, and um, I think of writers like RJ Barker and Jen Williams. I think of people like Peter Newman, uh, Tej Turner, uh, CL Clark. I think of the film Arrival and the TV show Ghosts. It's all doing really new stuff. And they've done it really well, so there's a way to hook in and kind of understand what's going on. But all of them have done something a little bit magical, which is, I think, where we have to be, which is we have, to need, we need, we have a need for the familiar in our games. Right? We can't really, we can, but I don't think it will work. 
we would really struggle to say to people, I need something completely, you, you're going to have to come and do this thing. It's not anything you're ever going to recognize. It's going to take you a while to get your head around it. I think that's a really tall order. But what we can do is say, oh, there's this thing, and it's like that thing there. And, and actually, you, know, you are going to have to go and defeat the bad guys. And you're going to have to climb that mountain there. And yes, we call it a mountain, because that's what it is. We're going to change the word for it uh, for its own sake. And all of a sudden, people go, oh, that's, oh I think I kind of get that. It's familiar to me. So I think the familiarity component is really important. So for me, the newness and the familiarity, you kind of have to find a way to give people something new, but make it feel like something they already know to help them, ease them in. And it may just be that it's, new, it's familiar on the surface and underneath all the systems are different. That's kind of a little bit of what I've kind of done and other writers have done at Curious Pastimes is we've tried to keep things recognizable on the surface as we're slowly making our way to kind of deconstructing some of these things we think of as problematic. But underneath, we've started to kind of take them to pieces and rebuild them in ways that we think, oh, actually, if it works like this, this is no longer problematic because it has its own internal thing that's unrelated to anything in the real world and we can explore new ideas from there. So a good example is we have a culture that is completely egalitarian, completely egalitarian. We have another culture that's completely driven by social obligation. We have another culture that is uh, communitarian, uh, which is uh, everybody lives for everybody else, basically, uh, which is different to egalitarian. So egalitarian is everybody is equal. Uh, but communitarian is where everybody is living for kind of everybody else in the community. Um, and we've got these on screen for players to kind of in interact with and understand how they work. We're trying to, oh, I'm trying when I'm writing them, that's my secret project underneath my plot, is I'm trying to show that there are different ways of being. Because I think one of the most exciting things about games like this is we don't have to all be kings and queens. We can say, ah, oh, why don't we try organizing society like this and see what happens? And what conflicts arise from that? Those are great stories to tell. It's also totally safe, so we can totally muck it up. I think good examples of the new but familiar. Again, some authors, but also a couple of uh, films and, and TV series. Lucy Hounsom, Stark Holborn. If you've not read uh, Ten Low, uh, you need to get out there and buy that book. It is the most fantastic space western uh, and she has totally undermined all the tropes of westerns it's really 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 good uh, there's Peter McLean who has uh, told a fantasy Peaky Blinders but again has totally deconstructed kind of some of the problematic elements of that uh, there's Simon Jimenez who has written a book called The Spear Cuts Through Water which is a book all about stories from a non-western perspective if you want to understand a master at work telling stories that are completely compelling and really experimental, that is the book you need to get hold of, although it's not out here in the UK till June. Um, but you can order it from the States and you can get it on, I think you can get it on Audible now. Um, sorry, I've been shilling for it for a whole year because it's that good. Kelly Link, uh, an American Pulitzer winner for short stories, has just published her first novel called The Book of Love. Again, non-standard storytelling, also beautiful, beautiful prose. Uh, I would read it just for her prose, because her prose is amazing. Actually, Emmy Lou introduced me to Kelly Link many years ago. Um, there's the film Moana, which might seem like a kid's story, but it's hugely subversive. In that film, men steal reproductive, the reproductive magic from women. And the only way to make the world right again is to give it back and let women be in charge of themselves. That is super subversive, especially in today's society. And that's just out there in that film. That's a really great way of telling that story. Uh, Umbrella Academy, which I suspect you haven't seen yet. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, I think Umbrella Academy is a really great way, again, of kind of questioning a lot of our assumptions about how things work and kind of rebuilding them. Really great story. Uh, and then I would like a couple of others, Aaliyah Whiteley, uh, Tade Thompson, Juliet McKenna. Juliet McKenna in particular is telling, she's retelling Arthurian uh, stories, but she's not retelling them from a woman's perspective, or she's just kind of retelling them completely from scratch. They're really, really great. So, founded in British folklore, I think she's really showing what can be done to kind of retell those stories in a way that fits modern society. I also think that we could talk a little bit about good, dip, good examples of different types of story, right? Read a Greek tragedy, educate yourselves if you haven't done that. And I don't mean to be patronizing, but what I mean is 
Greek tragedies are a form and they're the master, masterpiece of that form. And they tell stories that we don't really tell now, except when we're retelling the Greek version of them, right? We kind of, we like our happy ever afters. And there's reasons, sociological reasons for that, and I'm totally fine with that. I don't have a criticism of happy ever after, but I do want to say there are more stories than just happily ever after. American Fiction, which is a film in the cinemas at the moment, is a story about a man who lands himself in trouble and never gets out of it. The film ends with him not having got out of the trouble he gets himself into, or even explaining to anybody about the trouble that he's in. That is a great story. Right, he just kind of navigates his way awkwardly through the mess he's made. Any Studio Ghibli, uh, particularly The Boy and the Heron recently, uh, is a story about what it means to grow old and die. The story is basically about a man who has reached the end of his life and realises that he, his legacy that he thinks he's built means nothing. And everything he's built is going to crumble to dust. And there's nothing he can do about it. And he's, and he's coming to terms with acceptance of the fact that when he's gone, he's gone. There is nothing. It's, really, it's a really powerful film and it's a really interesting story to tell. And it's these types of stories we can help players play. There's no reason why we can't do that. So there's all sorts of different stories to tell. For me, it's about creating a space in which we can tell different types of stories. Telling new stories, telling stuff that feels familiar. If we're building worlds, we can build worlds that feel familiar but are different. And they're suitably different that they're not a retelling of the Bhagavad Gita or, or um, you know, uh, Journey to the West. Whatever. We're not just pillaging those for our own purposes and our own entertainment. They're genuinely kind of new stuff. Um, and that's kind of where I want to end it, because this is a discussion that doesn't end. Right? This is a discussion that's going to go on in perpetuity, because we're always going to have these kind of interactions and intersections between different cultures and different societies, between the young and the old, who have different views about how the world should work. Uh, and the best thing we can do is create ourselves a language to talk about them, and a language to kind of create a space where other people want to come in and go, I want to be part of your conversation. And in the end, that's what LARP is. It's a way of facilitating all sorts of fun and exciting conversations about the way the world is that leave us at the end with a feeling of catharsis and emotional high about what we've done, even if it's because our character died tragically. So before we move into Q&A, if there is any, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make uh, each row, and those of you at the back can kind of join the row in front of you, uh, I've got a couple of questions that I want you to kind of talk about with each other for like five minutes at most. And those are, um, so I want to know from you, if you were designing a game, what, what does good look like for you? Specifically though, as a game, from the world, what do you want from the world that you're playing in? What do you want from the, the kind of the peoples that you're going to meet? And what do you want from the stories that people are telling? And you can ignore me completely, right? I've just been talking. This is for you to kind of think about it for yourself. The second part, the second question for what does, it, what does good look like is for the people who come to your game, for them, what do you think good looks like? Right? And if you're going, and the other way to do, think about it is to flip it around and think, right, I'm thinking of a new game. I'm going to go to that game. What does good look like for me? What do I want from a game? Uh, and I'm going to give you five minutes whilst I have a drink. So off you go.